experiment actually was not called that until its last years when the final test took place in the Philadelphia Harbor, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Originally it was called the Project Invisibility. It began as a feasibility study in 1931 in Chicago with the participants being Dr. John Hutchinson, then Dean of the University of Chicago, later Chancellor, Nikola Tesla, and a third man, a physicist, uh, who has eluded me for some years in terms of his name, and he was involved in this project. They did a study. At that time, there was a great deal of speculation in the public press regarding the possibility of making an object invisible, doing the instant transference number from point A to point B, and so forth. Science had achieved a number of things by that time, and the popular press, meaning things like popular science, popular mechanics, had a great deal of speculation on these things. Tesla Hutchinson and uh, his associate got together and decided, let's see what we can do about it. It was at that point strictly a study. No hardware was built. Eventually, the project was transferred, 1934, to the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton University. The Institute of Advanced Study is not part of Princeton. It is on Princeton property. It was set up independently in 1930 by Messrs. Bamberger and company. And in 1933, they started staffing and actually started to work. One of the first people that came on board, of course, was Albert Einstein. Also a Dr. John Van Neumann, who joined in 1933 and a number of other people came on board at later times. Now the principles in back of this experiment are quite important. I will not go into a great detail at this time, but you had a precursor history of mathematics and physics, which was essential. Nikola Tesla was born in 1856 in Smiljan, Croatia, now part of uh, Yugoslavia. Poor parents, his father was a priest, his mother was illiterate, but apparently quite talented. He attended university in Yugoslavia in 1879, one year, and his father died and ran out of funds as a result of this, and he went to work for a living. Western Union, then he went to work for the, the Edison Company, the European division, or in 1984, 1884, I'm sorry, he left Europe and came to the United States. At that point, he had already gone into the early history and the development of the AC polyphase theory. He had a lot of notes on this. He had, as the saying goes, when he arrived in New York, a good working knowledge, if not a mastery, of 11 languages, four cents in his pocket, a book of poetry, but most important of all, a letter of introduction to Thomas Alva Edison. Eventually got to see Mr. Edison, and initially they had some disagreements because Edison was a DC man and Tesla, of course, was an AC man. Nevertheless, he went to work with Edison for approximately a year in his lab. And over a disagreement regarding money and promises made, Tesla left. In 18, I think it was 1885, he became, 1889, he became a naturalized citizen. 1885, he met other people, he developed his own lab. He became involved with Western Union in the United States. Eventually, he met George Westinghouse at one of the I, now called IEEE, then Institute of Radio Engineers or Electrical Engineers in the days before radio. Met George Westinghouse. Westinghouse took him to dinner at the Wall of Astoria and bought his 20 patents on AC theory, a million dollars cold cash, which was a great deal of money in those days, plus one dollar per horsepower. Later, this agreement was rescinded by Tesla, but in the meantime, this got him going and set up his labs, and he continued to do research. He was the first man to develop a commercial AC power generating system, Niagara Falls, 1892, I believe it was. 1893, he lit with AC power the Chicago World's Fair, also demonstrated a radio-controlled boat in the boat basin in 1893. He repeated this demonstration in 1898 at Madison Square Garden, New York. This is important to establish the fact that he was the first man to develop radio, not a certain man from 
Italy, who for many years Mr. Marconi claimed the fame of being the first. He was not. And this has been borne out in the courts in recent years. In 19, 1899 through 1900, Tesla went to Colorado Springs to do further basic research, which involved many things. Among others, he was concerned with the possible transmission of power by wireless means or through the ground as an alternative system. He, of course, in the meantime, had become connected with uh, rather wealthy people, uh, Mr. J.P. Morgan being the most important, who financed him for many years. Morgan was not, a, was not a visionary, he was a practical man. Tesla was a visionary, but he had the means to finance the research work of Tesla. When Tesla finally came to him after he was building the Wardenclyffe Tower in Long Island for the purpose of giving him radio and television transmission, of course, which very much excited Mr. Morgan. About 1906, he comes to him and says, Mr. Morgan, I really want to use this tower for wireless transmission of power. So as the movie done by Zagreb Productions says very clearly, Mr. Morgan turns to him and says, Mr. Tesla, do you mean to say that someone, by putting a rod in the ground and another in the air, can pick up all the free power they want and I can't put a meter on it? It didn't go over very well with Mr. Morgan. There were conflicting stories as to what happened then. One says that Morgan discontinued all funding, and Mr. Tesla himself, in his own autobiography, he did write one, believe it or not, says that Mr. Morgan, J.P. Morgan, kept his agreements to the letter. I can't prove it either way. The common accepted idea is that Morgan withdrew funding, the tower was never completed, and 1917 was dynamited. In 1917, Tesla became highly involved with the government in government war research, electronics, and uh, be, through this met Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was then Under Secretary of the Navy. Sir Roosevelt asked him if he would do work for the government during the war, and he said certainly he would. He was happy to, and he did. A part of the organizational setup, which Tesla was part of at that time, was the American Marconi Company. They were seized in 1917 or 18 as having foreign connections and so forth, and you know what kind of paranoia has developed during the war. The company was seized, Tesla was working with it. In 1919, August, RCA Corporation was set up as a result of this, as a new corporation. In December of 1919, they started operations. Tesla was a principal engineer there. A lot of other people were transferred in from American Marconi. Tesla remained with RCA until 1939. In 1935, it's not well known, but he was the vice president and director of all engineering and research for RCA worldwide. And he had his retirement party in Cherry Hill, New Jersey in 1939. And this is documented, it's in the archives, Ma Bell's archives of Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Now, yes, they have all the RCA records because a strange thing happened. Many companies didn't have the space to keep archives anymore. And Ma Bell says, we'll take any archives that anybody wishes to donate to us and keep them in perpetuity. So some of the documents exist there. Tesla did not bring a highly theoretical background to the study which became the eventually the Philadelphia experiment. He had an enormously accurate and good grasp intuitively and had additionally the ability to, vent to visualize whatever he was working on internally in his head. Now, other people became involved. In 1905 was born a gentleman known as Dr. John Eric von Neumann. Of course, he was not Dr. von Neumann then. He was a man of great mathematical ability. He took his degree in chemistry, his bachelor's degree in 1925, his PhD in math in 1926. One year separation, they could do it then and taught in Europe for four years, from nine, until 1930, when he left for the United States, became adjunct, adjunct professor of mathematics at Princeton, taught at the Princeton uh, University, the graduate school, then was invited to join the institute, which he did. At the same general time period, was born another man of great importance, Dr. David Hilbert, born in Germany, lived in Germany, took his PhD in math in Germany, and died in Germany in 1956, I believe, 53 approximately. 
Hilbert's contributions were enormous. He, of course, had understudied all of the other well-known mathematicians of Europe, Leibniz, and all the rest. And he developed five new systems of mathematics. The principal one of interest to us was his so-called Hilbert space, which was a mathematical representation of dealing with multiple realities in multiple space, and the mathematics per 